Let me tell you guys why I teach like I do. So C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, he said that everybody has a dragon that guards their heart. And to get into somebody's heart, you have to distract the dragon. So what you guys might not realize is that all kinds of things you're opposed to, if you package it in a funny package or if you package it in an entertaining package, it will go right past your dragon. And so basically, some pastors, some preachers will say, it's bad to entertain people. I think the more I entertain you, the more you pay attention. And if I can get deep stuff and important stuff in you through entertainment, I'm going to do it. Okay, uh, let's find out where we were last time. If, oh, there it goes. Uh, looks like you guys might have to switch me out. Ooh, okay. Why did they bring that down? I'll talk some more about some other stuff. So why do I use art like I do? Um, I've shown you a lot of interesting pictures, paintings. I have a collection of over 200,000 biblical pictures, 200 hours of video. And then I've been using an AI generator to make pictures I don't have or can't find online. The reason I do that is because art comes before politics, comes before theology, comes before all of it. It influences us in ways that we have no idea. And so ever since the founding of the spoken language, which is probably, well, written language, sorry, the written language goes back 4,000 years, art has been the inspiration for society. And up to 1960, art always built society. It always made it better. The height of this was around uh, the mid-1700s with the Romanticism movement. It made it seem like the world was greater than it was. If you watch one of those paintings, they're not just representing realism. They're showing something that it's hard to see with the eye and you can only see with the heart. And so you who are in here who are dedicated to Jesus, you who are artists, we need you to make great art that encourages people, that shows real struggle, but shows real depth within Christianity. All right, now I get this guy. There we go. All right, so here's where Virgil was last time. They went to the south, to the ancient ruin with his mom. Virgil had went to the building. His mom had turned to stone, gasp, shock. He had went into, into the door of the owl. He had got the orb of wisdom. So the metaphor is here. So far, we've seen wisdom, justice, and we're going to see a different one today. As he was in the door of the scales trying to get the justice orb, the scales orb, he failed because he had a lack of compassion to somebody and would not give them justice in the past. And so the room began to collapse, and he got out just in time, and that's where we're starting today. So Virgil gets out, out of the door. Augustine, his wise guide slash mentor, the one who is just showing them where the ruin was, greets him and he goes, did you get it? Where is the orb? And Virgil, like you guys saw yesterday, is devastated because he believes that he lost his chance to save his mom. He didn't get the orb of the scales. He failed and he didn't even have a chance to ask the genie for the wish that he thought he could get, but the genie was lying anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered. And so Virgil is devastated. And this is important for us because this happens to us. We will try something very, very hard and we'll go, God, this has got to be your will. Why am I failing? Why am, am I suffering? So as Virgil lies there devastated and Augustine, like a normal man, is going, I can't believe you lost it. I can't believe you didn't get there. 
they hear something behind them, and they turn around, and from the darkness in the back of the ruin walks this girl. She asks them, what are you guys doing here? And they, they said, we came to explore this building that was recently uncovered in the landslide. And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember that happening a month ago. And they're, they're like, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh, I come in here. I've been coming in here for like three or four years to pray. What? How did you get in here? Through the back cave, the back door? It's been open the whole time. I'm Faith. So she introduces herself. And Virgil, his eyes dried because he's distracted, looks up at her, and she's like, what's wrong with him, Augustine? And Augustine tells her the story. She sees Virgil's mom, and she looks at Virgil, and she goes over, and Virgil has stand up, stood up, and his head's down, and he's ashamed, and she just goes over to him, and she gives him a hug. Girls, you have no idea with guys, if they're devastated, if they're hurt, how you can heal us. I'm totally serious. I'll talk about it more in a second. So faith says, I don't, I don't care that you didn't get the orb, Virgil. I don't care about what you did in your past. Virgil, your past cannot define you. It can be a part of you, but you cannot live in your past, and your past can be, not be all you are made up of. You need to push forward. We'll talk about the, the orb of the scales afterwards, but right now I think you need to go into the door of the lion. So she takes Virgil, and she pushes him towards it. And Virgil, his doubt diminishing, and once again, because of faith's faith in him, begins to push forward through the door of the lion. Inside of the door of the lion, he finds a man standing there holding the orb of the lion. And the man says, welcome. You're not the first to be here. Nobody has ever gotten this orb. You will not get this orb. And the reason is, is to get it, you have to touch me. And nobody can touch me. Virgil begins to walk towards him. And as he walks towards him, the man puts his fists together and he begins to glow. And as he glows, light waves and wind begin to come off of him. And they are so strong that they are just pushing Virgil back and back. And Virgil is beginning to go, no, no, I can't lose again. I cannot lose again. And he begins to push as hard as he can push against everything that this guy is giving him. And as he pushes against it, he's just thinking, this is so painful. I cannot move forward anymore. But he keeps thinking about his mom, and he keeps thinking about faith is faith in him. And he keeps going, I have to take another step. I have to take another step. One more step. One more step. One more step. And he pushes forward. The lion. The lion is a test of fortitude. What is fortitude? I'm bringing out the big, deep, meaningful words. These are words that are almost disappearing from our society, but these are the words that make life worth living. Wisdom, justice, fortitude, fortitude, resilience, long-suffering, courage and bravery are defined from fortitude. Fortitude, how much pain, how much difficulty, how much loss can you put up with to achieve the goal that you need to achieve? All right, this is a comic book picture of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You know, the one where he makes fun of them and says, is your God Baal relieving himself somewhere? Where is he? And the fire comes down and burns up the sacrifice. This is an amazing victory. This is like... God's backing him up, does this crazy miracle for Elijah. But if you guys remember afterwards, God then brings rain, but then Elijah is like depressed. He's suffering. He's alone. And he just went through this big battle, and he's wounded. He's wounded like Virgil was wounded. What happens to him afterwards? Anybody remember? An angel shows up, takes care of him. Let's go forward in time a little bit. Jesus is being tempted by Satan. Hey, 
You're hungry. You've been in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. You've been fasting, which is possible as long as you're having liquid to not eat food for 40 days and 40 nights. I know people who've done it. So Jesus is very, very weak at this point. And I can tell you that our bodies, and this is because I'm a computer guy, we're like hardware. We have operating parameters. You don't get enough sleep, you don't get enough food, and you do not operate well. You can be broken. You can behave poorly. You can sin because you're not all together. Satan's coming to Jesus at his most vulnerable time. Jesus passes the tests. What happens to him after? Angels take care of him again. Again, Jesus is under intense suffering, such intense suffering that he sweats blood. What happens to him afterwards? Angels comfort him again. Jesus gets crucified. He dies. When he wakes up, who are the people that are there to greet him? The angels. Okay, here's the point with this. I'm going to explain a little bit about men and women. And when I say this stuff, this is a kind of a hard concept here, but here's a bell curve. Most men fall right here. Some men are here. Some men are here. If this does not fit you, it is okay. You are still a man. Here's a bell curve with women. It intersects with men somewhat. If you're a woman in this here or here, it's fine. You're still a woman. I'm going to talk about generalities for a second. In general, men are warriors. Do you guys know that there's an incredible disparity between how many men are in prison and how many women are in prison? There is a ton more men in prison than women. In general, if you look at the history of ancient warfare, there was very, very, very few women that fought in wars. In general, it was almost completely a male endeavor. So in general, men have more aggression than women, and that aggression can be both a good and a bad thing. Christianity in the modern times has begun to try to get men to operate like women. No, men, you need to be warriors, but you need to be warriors for the right reason. Women are healers, and what I mean by that is like Faith did with Virgil, you have the potential to basically heal society. Women are creatures of the internal, men are creatures of the external. Let me explain that, and you guys will recognize this a little bit. Movies are not good at internal monologues. They're not good at monologues at all. When somebody just talks in a movie, it is so boring. You're supposed to show, not tell. One of the fundamental rules of movies. Show. You show action. There has to be something that is going on visually. So men respond to this. We are creatures of the visual. And it's really interesting because when are, like, uh, mind science, like when they study the brain, that they've shown this. When men are born, they are born brain damaged. And when I say brain damaged, what happens is there's a chemical in our mind that releases, that makes it so both hemispheres of our mind cannot communicate at the same time. So we're either thinking with this side of our brain or this side of our brain. This side of our brain, or this side of our brain. And what it means is that we have really stronger, direct focus, and sometimes more intensity about goals than women do. On the flip side, women do not have that chemical released, and so both their hemispheres communicate together, so women are really good at multitasking. Women are very good at communication. Did you know women have five times as many words as men do during a day? They like to talk five times as much? Is this a surprise to anybody? It was, it was so frustrating to me when I was younger because I would come home from work and my wife would start talking to me, one of my daughters would start talking to me, and my other daughter's talking to me, and I don't think any of them realized that the other one was talking to me, but I was trying to listen to all three of them at the same time. Meanwhile, I had no words left, so I was just like, all right, I'm listening. Okay, books though. Books are very good at internal monologues. So you could have a great book, that if you make a movie out of it, it's going to be lousy because it is all about thoughts and emotions. And so women have a tendency to have much more complicated emotions. When you have a man who ends up like abusing his wife or beating his wife, here's what happens. He goes from here to here, and this is physical or a burst out of anger. The reason is is because he has no emotional tools in between, typically. 
Like, he needs to learn them. But he basically, ah, this is my only reaction. This is my only defense. And especially if he had, women, oftentimes you guys can be brutally manipulative if you try. So I'm giving you this warning. Do not develop this in your personality. But if you have one of those women that's nitpicking, nagging, nitpicking, nagging, nitpicking, nagging, nitpicking, nagging, Basically, she knows what she's doing. She's, she's doing a, a slow mode warfare against him. But he doesn't have the tools to do that back. So eventually, he's just like, ah! Okay, so men are physical. Women are spiritual emotional. So what's really interesting is the church of Satan, its leader is a woman. Okay, uh, which is? Oftentimes, women. There isn't really as many, like, warlocks. There is, but in general, women. Um, so in the Bible, you know, there's this part where the, the church of Corinth is going crazy and the women are causing a problem. And so there's this advice that Paul's giving, and I'm not going to go in depth into the advice, but one of the ideas there is that because the guys are more goal focused, more conflict oriented, because women oftentimes will do cold warfare where it's, it's not like outright, they kind of like pick at each other. Um, they basically would have guys kind of be in front of the church and, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more. But it was interesting because the Romans with Christianity, there's a guy named Pliny, and Pliny said, oh yeah, I've heard of this religion of Christianity. It's a religion for women. And the reason is, is Christianity has always had more women in it than men. And honestly, from my experience with women, I think that the spiritual veil is thinner for them. I think that they can sense demons easier. I think that they can get affected by them to an extent easier. Uh, Men, we are creatures of extreme. If we're going to suffer, it will, like, pull us all the way. So you guys get an idea of some of this stuff. These are our thoughts to chew on. This is not gospel. This is not canon. I make mistakes. I can be wrong. You guys will be able to discuss amongst yourselves at another time. Okay, one, one or two more thoughts about men and women real quick. So this is a nuclear reactor. This is men have incredible reactive power. But the problem with our reactive power is it is all over the place. And what I mean, it is unfocused. It will be crazy. We will be destructive. We will, and this is why, you know, most wars are done by men. Yes, they're done by men because we are, are destructive. This right here is control rods. The control rods are women. So my three greatest influences, Jesus, number one, my mom, number two, and Green Lantern, which is another discussion. But Jesus... My mom, my mom, not my dad, my mom, because my mom has directed me so much to the person that I am. Beyond that, though, do you guys think that I would be here today if I had not met Abigail? If I had married the wrong woman in America, there's no way I would be here. There's no way, I, there's, there's a good chance I wouldn't even be walking with Jesus. Yo, women, influence men correctly. You have so much power. Direct us to be great for God, for you, and for the family. Okay, let's talk about men. What makes us give up? Okay, so Virgil, he gave up because he lost faith. These virtues I'm teaching you are the four virtues of the Greek and Roman heroes. So, so far, wisdom, justice, fortitude, we have one for tomorrow, what Christian theologians have found is they, they are inadequate. And the reason they are inadequate is because the motivation behind them is too small. And so the thing about faith, both the character and faith in general, is it lets us see greater meaning in everything. There is a point where I was watching movies and I began to be frustrated because they were so small, because they did not have a spiritual dimension. Small. The stakes were always small. Yes, small, because they did not have a spiritual dimension. There is a greater world. There is something bigger going on. This is my mom, 1960. She came over from Cuba, running from the communists who were persecuting her family. When she arrived, she ends up in Colorado, and she becomes the queen of a college parade. And that's where this, this uh, picture was taken. She had to learn English. She was an immigrant. Crazy how I married somebody from a different country, huh? Anyway, this is my mom after she had gotten done going through horrible, horrible chemo after having stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer, which is basically as bad as it gets. 
She was in remission at this point. She looked way worse before this picture. But you can tell that she's thin, that she's frail. All of us are going to die. My mom was emotionally crazy during this period. My mom was having to push through incredibly difficult things that were financial, that were family-related, so much. This is me during that period. See me when I'm a little bit younger. I dropped out of college. I was supporting my parents. Shout out to the 11th graders because they know the story way better than the rest of you guys because I talked to them about it yesterday. Uh, I'd lost all my friends. My faith had self-destructed. I was watching my mom die in front of me. And every day, I wished for death. I hated it. It was painful. And the reason is, is because I had no faith. I could not see the other end. I could not see the end of my suffering. This is what Christianity does. This is what faith does. It lets us see through and process suffering the way that it needs to be processed through. It's Job. Job wasn't processing well. I wasn't either. I made this picture in AI. The reason I made this picture is, men, you have to understand, we are supposed to die younger than the women. Why? Because we are their shield. We are the family shield. We are society's shield. This guy, that scar that he has on his face, means that he has done the right thing. He has conflicted for the right reasons. He has suffered for those around us, him, and protected them. Men, th this is us. This is the ring of fire. We are the ring of fire, men. Our family is inside of that. Society is inside of that. And the threats are outside of that. You need to step up, make sure your nuclear reaction isn't going in the right direction, and you need to be a hero. You need to have fortitude to push for the right things. I'm talking to every man in this room right now. Okay, so why faith? Why the character? Why put her in? Okay, so again, we can be a monster. Men can be a monster. But as we're going against that monster... We need motivation to go against that monster. And here's the problem. I know this is so hard for a lot of us because Jesus became human, but God is not human. He is a different sort of creature. He does not behave like us. The rules he's established for himself are unsatisfying to us. And the reason I say that is we want him to be like right here physical and go, hey, God, well, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? You know, like, but he doesn't operate that way. Sometimes the God of Israel is a God who conceals himself. That's from Isaiah. And so what we need is we need a physical, tangible representation of God. We need somebody that will help us with motivation. We need somebody to model God to us. We need somebody to see past ourselves. We need somebody that views us as a hero. And so faith is a metaphor for God. Is she an idol? No. You remember Genesis 2.18? Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. God was already with man. He gave us woman specifically because we needed woman. We needed somebody to do that. Our role towards women is also modeling God, but a completely different way. It is not good. Okay. So Virgil, back to him. Knowing this, Virgil continues to press forward. No matter how much pain he is going through, no matter how much difficulty he is going through, he gets to the guy, he touches the guy, and the guy disappears, and the orb drops. Virgil picks up the orb of the lion. He brings it out, and now he has the orb of the lion and the orb of the owl. But he has a problem now. He's still missing the orb of the scales. He can't turn his mom back into flesh without the orb of the scales. And that, now that he came back successfully with the orb of the lion and he's regained himself, Faith goes, hey, I didn't tell you this before, but I have something to tell you. Did you know that the room of the scales has a back door? Is there still a chance for the justice orb? What about the ice door? That will come tomorrow. Let me pray for you guys.
Lord Jesus, thank you for this chapel and thank you for this time with these people, God. I pray that this stuff is getting deep into their heart, God, and that you raise up some heroes for you on the level of the Hall of Faith in Hebrews, God. Let great people come out of this room, God, people that impact the world for you in a deep and meaningful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we say to these things there is still cancer and so much disease? What shall we say to these things? There's so much violence, it's getting hard to believe. So many questions, but still no